Hi everybody, welcome back to Glass Castle Reading. We This is gonna be for Tuesday, January 11th, and this is pages, we're gonna do 42 to 53 today. Page 42. At twilight, once the sun had slid behind the Palin Mountains, the bats came out and swirled through the sky above the shacks of Midland. The old lady who lived next door warned us away from the bats. She called them flying rats and said she caught one in her hair once and went crazy and it went crazy clawing at her scalp. But I love those ugly little bats, the way they darted past their wings in a furious blur. Dan explained how they had sonar detectors, kind of like the ones in nuclear submarines. Brian and I would throw pebbles, hoping the bats would think they were bugs and eat them, and the weight of the pebbles would pull them down, and we could keep them as pets, tying a long string to one of their claws so we could still, they could still fly around. I wanted to train one to hang upside down from my finger. Those darn bats were always too clever to fall for our trick. They also had rabies, so stay away, kids. The bats were out swooping and screeching when we left Midland for Blythe. Earlier that day, Mom had told us that the baby had decided it was big enough to come out soon and join the family. Once we were on the road, Dad and Mom got in a big fight over how many months she'd been pregnant. Mom said she was 10 months pregnant. Dad, who had fixed someone's transmission earlier that day and used the money he'd made to buy a bottle of tequila, said she probably lost track somewhere. I always carry my children longer than most women, Mom said. Lori is in my womb for 14 months. Bullshit, Dad said, unless Lori's part elephant. Don't you make fun of me or my children, Mom yelled. Some babies are premature. Mine were all post-mature. That's why they're so smart. Their brains had longer to develop. Dad said something about freaks of nature. Mom called Dad and Mr. Know it all smarty pants, refused to believe that she was special. Dad said something about Jesus H. Christ on a goddamn crutch, not taking too much time to gestate. Mom got upset at Dad's blasphemy, reached her foot over to the driver's side and stomped on the brake. It was the middle of the night. Mom bolted out of the car and ran into the darkness. You crazy bitch, Dad hollered. Get your goddamn ass back in this car. I'm whispering because Frizzle's sleeping by me and I don't want her to think I'm swearing at her. You make me, Mr. Tough Guy, she screamed as she ran away. Dad jerked the steering wheel on one side and drove off the road into the desert after her. Lori, Brian, and I braced one another with our arms, just like we always did when Dad went on some wild chase that we knew would get bumpy. Dad stuck his head out the window as he drove, hollering at Mom, calling her a stupid whore and a stinking C-word, and ordering her to get back in the car. Mom refused. She was ahead of us, bobbing in and out of the desert brush. Since she never used curse words, she was calling Dad names like blankety-blank and worthless drunk so-and-so. Dad stopped the car, then jammed down the accelerator and popped the clutch. We shot forward to toward Mom, who screamed and jumped out of the way. Dad turned around and went for her again. It was a moonless night, so we couldn't see Mom except for when she ran into the beam of the headlights. She kept looking over her shoulder, her eyes wide like a hunted animal's. We kids cried and begged Dad to stop, but he ignored us. I was even more worried about the baby inside Mom's swollen belly than I was about her. The car bounced on holes and rocks, brush scratching against its sides, and dust coming through the open windows. Finally, Dad cornered Mom against some rocks. I was afraid he might smush her with the car, but instead he got out and dragged her back, legs flailing, and threw her into the car. We banged back through the desert and onto the road. Everyone was quiet except Mom, who was sobbing that she really did carry Lori for 14 months. Mom and Dad made up the next day, and by late afternoon, Mom was cutting Dad's hair in the living room in the apartment we rented in Blythe. He'd taken off his shirt and was sitting backward on a chair with his head bowed and his hair combed forward. Mom was snipping away while Dad pointed out the parts that were still too long. When they were finished, Dad combed his hair back and announced that Mom had done a hell of a fine shearing job. Our apartment was in a one-story cinder block building on the outskirts of town. It had a big blue and white plastic sign in the shape of an oval and a boomerang that said, The LBJ Apartments. I thought it st stood for Lori, Brian, and Jeanette, but Mom said LBJ were the initials of the president, who, she added, was a crook and a warmonger. A few truck drivers and cowboys had rooms at the LBJ Apartments, but most of the other people who lived there were migrant workers and their families. We heard them talking through the thin sheetrock walls. Mom said it was one of the bonuses of living at the LBJ Apartments because we'd be able to pick up a little Spanish without even studying. Blythe was in California, but the Arizona border was within spitting distance. People who lived there liked to say the town was 150 miles west of Phoenix, 250 miles east of Los Angeles, and smack dab in the middle of nowhere. 
but they always said it like they were bragging. Mom and Dad weren't exactly crazy about Blythe. Too civilized, they said, and downright unnatural, since no town the side of Blythe had any business existing out in the Mojave Desert. It was near the Colorado River, founded in the 19th, back in the 19th century, by some guy who figured out he could get rich, turning the desert into farmland. He dug a bunch of irrigation ditches that drained water out of the Colorado River to grow lettuce and grapes and broccoli, right there in the middle of all the cactus and sagebrush. Dad got disgusted every time we drove past one of those farm fields with their irrigation ditches wide as moats. It's a goddamn perversion of nature, he'd say. If you want to live in the farmland, haul your sorry hide off to Pennsylvania. If you want to live in the desert, eat prickly pears, not iceberg pansy s lettuce. That's right, Mom would say. Prickly pears have more vitamins anyway. Living in a big city like Blythe meant I had to wear shoes. It also meant I have to go to school. School wasn't so bad. I was in the first grade, and my teacher, Miss Cook, always chose me to read aloud when the principal came into the classroom. The other students didn't like me very much because I was t so tall and pale and skinny and always raised my hand too fast and wa waved it frantically in the air whenever Miss Cook asked a question. A few days after I started school, four Mexican girls followed me home and jumped me in the alleyway near the LBJ apartments. They beat me up pretty bad, pulling my hair and tearing my clothes and calling me a teacher's pet and a matchstick. That night, I came home with scraped knees and elbows and bu a busted lip. I came home that night with scraped knees and elbows and a busted lip. Looks to me like he got in a fight, Dad said. He was sitting at the table, taking apart an old alarm clock with Brian. Just a little dust up, I said. That was the word Dad always used after he'd been in a fight. How many were there? Six, I lied. Is that a split lip okay, he asked. This little old scratch, I asked. You should have seen what I did to them. That's my girl, Dad said and went back to the clock, but Brian kept looking over at me. The next day, when I got to the alley, the Mexican girls were waiting for me. Before they could attack, Brian jumped out from behind a, a clump of sagebrush, waving a yucca branch. Brian was shorter than me and just as skinny with freckles across his nose and sandy red hair that fell into his eyes. He wore my hand-me-down pants, which I had inherited from Lori and then passed on to him. him. They were always sliding off his bony behind. Just back off now, and everyone can walk away with all their limbs still attached, Brian said. It was another one of Dad's, Dad's lines. The Mexican girls stared at him before bursting into laughter. Then they surrounded him. Brian did fairly well fending them off until the yucca branch broke. Then he disappeared beneath a flurry of swinging fists and kicking feet. I grabbed the biggest rock I could find and hit one of the girls on the head with it. From the jolt in my arm, I thought it cracked her skull. She sank to her knees. One of her friends pushed me to the ground and kicked me in the face, and then they all ran off, the girl I had hit holding her head as she staggered along. Brian and I got up. His face was covered with sand. All I could see were his blue eyes peering out and a couple splot spots of blood seeping through. I wanted to hug him, but that would have been too weird. Brian stood up and gestured for me to follow him. We climbed through a hole in the chain link fence he had discovered that morning and ran into the iceberg lettuce farm next to the apartment building. I followed him through the, the rows of big green leaves, and we eventually settled down to feast, burying our faces in the huge wet heads of lettuce and eating until our stomachs ached. I guess we scared him off pretty good, I said to Brian. I guess, he said. He never liked to brag, but I could tell he was proud he had taken on four bigger, tougher kids, even if they were girls. Lettuce war, Brian shouted. He tossed a half-eaten head at me like a grenade. We ran along the rows, pulling up heads and throwing them at each other crop duster flew overhead. We waved at it as it made a pass above the field. A cloud sprayed out from behind the plane, and a fine white powder came sprinkling down on our heads. Two months after we moved to Blythe, when Mom said she was 12 months pregnant, she at last gave birth. After she'd been in the hospital for two days, we all drove out to pick her up. Dad led us kids waiting in the car with the engine idling when he went in for Mom. They came running out with Dad's arm around Mom's shoulders. Mom was cradling a bundle in her arms and giggling sort of guiltily like she'd stolen a candy bar from a dime store. I figured he, they had checked out Rex Walls style. What is it? Lori asked as we spread, sped away. Girl, Mom said. Mom handed me the baby. I was going to be six in a few months, and Mom said I was mature enough to hold her the entire way home. The baby was pink and wrinkly, but absolutely beautiful with big blue eyes, soft wisps of blonde hair, and the tiniest fingernails I'd ever seen. She moved in confused, jerky motions as, she couldn't, as if she couldn't understand why Mom's belly wasn't still around her. I promised her I'd always take care of her. The baby went on without a name for weeks. Mom said she wanted to study it first, 
the way she would, would the subject of a painting. We had a lot of arguments over what the name should be. I wanted to call her Rosita after the prettiest girl in my class, but Mom said that name was too Mexican. I thought we weren't supposed to be prejudiced, I said. It's not being prejudiced, Mom said. It's a matter of accuracy and labeling. She told us that both our grandparents were angry because neither Lori nor I had been named after them, so she decided to call the baby Lily Ruth Maureen. Lily was Mom's mother's name, and Irma Ruth was Dad's mother's name. But we call the baby Maureen, a name Mom liked, because it was a diminutive of Mary, but she, so she'd also be naming the baby after herself, but pretty much no one would know it, because her name's Rosemary. That, Dad told us, would make everyone happy except his mom, who hated the name Ruth and wanted the baby called Irma, and Mom's mom, who would hate sharing her namesake with Dad's mom. A few months after Maureen was born, a squad car tried to pull us over because the brake lights on the green caboose, caboose weren't working. Dad took off. He said that if the cops stopped us, they'd find out we had no registration or insurance and that the license plate had been taking off, taken off another car and they'd arrest us all. After barreling down the highway, he made a screeching U-turn with us kids feeling like the car was going to tumble over on its side, but the squad car made one, made one too. Dale, Dad, peer, blah, 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 Dad peeled through Blythe at 100 miles an hour, ran a red light, cut the wrong way up a one-way street, the other cars honking and pulling over. He made a few more turns that headed down an alley and found an empty garage to hide in. We heard the sound of the siren a couple blocks away and then it faded. Dad said that since the Gestapo would have their eyes out for the green caboose, we'd have to leave it in the garage and walk home. The next day, he announced that Blythe had become a little too hot and we were hitting the road again. This time, he knew where we were going. Dad had been doing some research and settled on a town in northern Nevada called Battle Mountain. There was gold in Battle Mountain, Dad said, and he intended to go after it with the prospector. Finally, we were going to strike it rich. Mom and Dad rented a great big U-Haul truck. Mom explained that since only she and Dad could fit in the front of the U-Haul, Lori, Brian, Maureen, and I were in for a treat. We got to ride in the back. It would be fun, she said, a real adventure, but there wouldn't be any lights, so we'd have to use all of our resources to entertain one another. Plus, we were not allowed to talk. Since it was illegal to ride in the back, anyone who heard us might call the cops. Mom told us the trip would be about 14 hours if we took the highway, but we should tack on a couple more hours because we might take, make some fun scenic detours. We packed up what furniture we had. There wasn't much, mostly parts for the prospector and a couple of chairs and Mom's oil paintings and art supplies. When we were ready to leave, Mom wrapped Maureen in a lavender blanket and passed her to me, and we kids all climbed in the back of the U-Haul. Dad closed the doors. It was pitch black and the air smelled stale and dusty. We were sitting on the ribbed wooden floor on frayed stained blankets used to wrap furniture, feeling for one another with our hands. Here goes the adventure. I, whoops. Here goes the adventure, I whispered. Shh, Lori said. The U-Haul started up and lurched forward. Maureen let loose with a loud, high-pitched wail. I shushed her and rocked her and patted her, but she kept crying, so I gave her to Lori, who whispered sing-song into her ears and told jokes. That didn't work either, so we begged Maureen to please stop crying, and then we just put our hands over our ears. After a while, it got cold and uncomfortable in the back of the, the dark U-Haul. The engine made the floor vibrate, and we'd all go tumbling whenever we hit a bump. Several hours passed. By then, we were all dying to pee and wondered it, wondered and wondering if Dad was going to pull over for a rest stop. Suddenly, with a bang, we had a huge pothole, and the back doors of the U-Haul flew open. The wind shrieked through the, the compartment. We were afraid we were going to get sucked out, and we all shrank to the back against the prospector. The moon was out. We could see the glow from the U-Haul's taillights and the road we'd come down, stretching back through the silvery desert. The unlocked doors swung back and forth with loud clangs. Since the furniture was stored between us and the cabin, we couldn't knock on the wall to get Mom and Dad's attention. We banged on the sides of the U-Haul and hollered as loud as we could, but the engine was too noisy and they didn't hear us. Brian crawled to the back of the van. When one of the doors swung in, he grabbed at it, but it flew open again, jerking him forward. I thought the door was going to drag Brian out, but he jumped back just in time and scrambled along the wooden floor toward Lori and me. Brian and Lori held tight to the prospector, which Dad had tied securely with ropes. I was holding Maureen, who for some strange reason had stopped crying. I wedged myself into a corner. It seemed like we'd have to ride it out. Then a pair of headlights appeared way in the distance behind us. We watched as the car slowly caught up with the U-Haul. 
After a few minutes, it pulled right behind us. Its headlights caught us, in, uh, caught us there in the back of the cab. The car started honking and flashing its brights. Then it pulled up and passed us. The driver must have sig signaled Mom and Dad because the U-Haul slowed to a stop and Dad came running back with a flashlight. What the hell is going on? He asked. He was furious. We tried to explain that it wasn't our fault the doors blew open, but he was still angry. I knew he was scared, too. Maybe even more scared than angry. Was that a cop? Brian asked. No, Dad said. And you're sure as hell lucky it wasn't, or he'd be hauling your asses to jail. After we peed, we climbed back in the truck and watched as Dad closed the doors. The darkness enveloped us again. We could hear Dad locking the doors and double-checking them. The engine restarted, and we continued on our way. Battle Mountain had started out as a mining post, settled a hundred years earlier by people hoping to strike it rich, but if anyone had ever struck it rich in Battle Mountain, they must have moved somewhere else to spend their fortune. Nothing about the town was grand, except a big, empty sky, and off in the distance, the stony, purple Tuscatora Mountains running down the flat, table flat desert. The main street was wide, with sun-bleached cars and pickups parked at an angle by the curb. Only a few blocks along, flanked on both sides with low, flat-roofed buildings made of adobe or brick. A single street light flashed red, red day and night. Along Main Street was a grocery store, a drugstore, a Ford dealership, a Greyhound bus station, and two big casinos, the Owl Club and the, the Nevada Hotel. The buildings, which seemed puny under the huge sky, had neon signs that didn't look like they were on during the day because the sun was so bright. We moved into a wooden building on the edge of town that had once been a railroad depot. It was two stories tall and painted an industrial green and was so close to the railroad tracks you could wave to the engineer from the front window. Our new home was one of the oldest buildings in town, Mom proudly told us, with a real frontier quality to it. Mom and Dad's bedroom was on the second floor where the station manager had once had his office. We kids slept downstairs in what had been the waiting room. The old restaurants were still there, but the toilet had been ripped out of one and a bathtub put in its place. The ticket booth had been converted into a kitchen. Some of the original benches were still bolted to the unpainted wood walls, and you could see the dark, worn spots where prospectors and miners and their wives and children had sat waiting for the train, their behinds polishing the wood. Since we didn't have money or f for furniture, we improvised. A bunch of huge wooden spools, the kind that hold industrial cable, had been dumped on the side of the tracks not far from our house, so we rolled them home and turned them into tables. What kind of fools would waste money on store-bought tables when they can have these for free? Dad said as he pounded the top of the spools to show us how sturdy they were. For chairs, we used some smaller spools and a few crates. Instead of beds, we kids each slept in a big cardboard box like the ones refrigerators got delivered in. A little while after we'd moved into the depot, we heard Mom and Dad talking about buying us kids real beds, and we said they shouldn't do it. We liked our boxes. They made going to bed seem like an adventure. Shortly after we moved into the, deep, the depot, Mom decided what we really needed was a piano. Dad found a cheap upright when a saloon in the next town over went out of business, and he borrowed a neighbor's pickup to bring it home. We slid off the pickup down, it off the pickup down a ramp, but it was too heavy to carry. To get it into the depot, Dad devised a system of ropes and pulleys that he had attached to the piano in the front yard and ran through the house and out the back door where they were tied to the pickup. The plan was for Mom to ease the truck forward, pulling the piano into the house while Dad and we kids guided it up the ramp of planks and through the front door. Ready? Dad hollered when we were all in our positions. Okie doke, Mom shouted. But instead of easing forward, Mom, who had never quite gotten the hang of driving, hit the gas pedal hard and the truck shot head. The piano jerked out of our hands, sending us lurching forward and bounced into the house, splintering the door frame. Dad screamed at Mom to slow down, but she kept going and dragging the screeching, cord-banging piano across the depot floor and right through the rear door, splintering its frame too, and then out into the backyard where it came to rest next to a thorny bush. Dad came running through the house. What in the Sam Hill were you doing? He yelled at Mom. I told you to go slow. I was only doing 25, Mom said. You get mad at me when I go that slow on the highway. She looked behind her and saw the piano sitting in the backyard. Oopsie daisy, she said. Mom wanted to turn around and drag it back into the house from the other direction, but Dad said that was impossible because the railroad tracks were too close to the front door to get the pickup in position. So the piano stayed where it was. 
On the days Mom felt inspired, she took her sheet mu music and one of our spool chairs out outside and pounded away at her music back there. Most penis never get the chance to play in the great outdoors, she said, and now the whole neighborhood can enjoy the music too. Be back for the next uh, set of pages tomorrow.